Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. Hi, welcome. Hello. Um, so I think we'll get started. There will probably be oops, walking in um, or coming in, zooming in as we go, which is great. Um, but I want to welcome Heather um, to our uh, club event here at LAU Post Photo. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Whose doggy is that? <laughs> Not mine. Did we all mute um, and just just so this way? Um, yeah, maybe if everybody could put their their mic on mute. I'd rather not do it on you. <laughs> um, but perhaps I think maybe I'll start by reading Heather, a little bit about Heather. Um, she's a nature loving experimental photographer whose work revolves around the relationship between humans and mother nature, science and her introspection. Her favorite mediums are light and chemistry based, um, working with pinhole photography, cyanotypes, and lumen prints. Her award-winning work has been exhibited locally and internationally. Um, in addition to being an exhibiting artist, um, she is also a photography teacher and um, runs a family portrait photography business. Mm -hmm. um, so we're super excited to hear directly from you and all your experiences. So we can give a clap and a warm <laughs> welcome to Heather. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much again for coming. Yeah, no problem. Um, so when I was first talking with Nora about doing the Zoom meeting, uh, she had asked me to go through like my journey and my history of how I got to where I am. So I think I'll go through um, some of my timeline um, and I'll try to show like a lot of pictures so I don't just bore you with my biography. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm going to share some of my current work um, and she asked to share some of my secrets too. So um, I think a little bit of background on me is a good way to get started. And then please know that um, just like your speaker you had last week, that if anyone wants to interrupt at any time and ask any questions, I'd love for it to be like interactive, if that's okay with you guys also. So it's not like um, I'm just like lecturing. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll start with um, some of my personality traits that influence my work and I've played a part in why I do what I do and kind of like how my brain and thought process works. I think you'll understand my work a little bit better that way. Um, I would describe myself in the context of being an artist as someone who's always loved nature, as you just read off of my bio. Um, I've always really loved science and math. I have a left brain, which um, is kind of strange for an artist, but I think in a really logical way. Um, I'm a tinkerer. I love to like pull things apart and put them back together. I'm a really curious person. Um, so I think that's where I get into a lot of my like experimental photography. Um, and I really love to work with my hands. But then on the other side of me, I'm like this total free spirit, like spontaneous, adventurous person. And I'm constantly having this like push and pull inside of me of this like rigidity versus spontaneity. Um, and my most recent project that I haven't even published yet um, works with that. So that'll be one of the last things I show you. But all of these like traits about me have definitely contributed to like my approaches and how I make my artwork over the years um, and are why I fell in love with photography. So I actually got my start in photo when I was in high school. I took a darkroom photo class in 2002. Prior to that, I had no experience with photography other than like bringing a disposable camera around like to school and like parties with friends and I just like love taking pictures. Um, so I thought it would be a cool class to take. But I never imagined that it would completely change my life. Um, I absolutely just fell in love with it. I liked the math involved in the camera. Um, I liked the chemistry in the dark room. It felt like really scientific, but artistic and experimental. And it just like really activated a lot in me. So um, it was also the first time in my life, I think, that something I had like a real connection to it. Uh, I hadn't really been good at anything prior to that. So it 
I think when you're like a teenager and you're trying to find like your thing, when I found it, I like really held on to it and it was really momentous for me. So I decided that year that I wanted to grow up to be a high school photo teacher. So I went to Montclair State University and I got an art education degree um, concentrating in photography. I took about maybe like six classes and at the time digital like was not a thing. I was uh, like I majored in large format film photography. Um, funny enough, I actually, I thought digital photography was like a passing fad and I hated it and I thought it was so stupid and that like no one would ever use digital cameras. Um, so yeah, that happened. I was wrong. Um, <laughs> when I graduated, I didn't get my dream job. Um, I didn't realize how hard it is to be a high school photo teacher that they're just like aren't jobs available readily. Um, but I did get a job teaching first through eighth grade general art and I loved it. Um, I did that for two years and I'm about to admit something that I'm like super ashamed of and I've never admitted to anyone before. Um, but I'm telling you because I know that you guys, um, there's a lot of students from the college. Some of you maybe are graduating next week um, and this might happen to you. But after I graduated and I was working uh, teaching for those two years, I didn't pick up a camera for two full years. Um, and I didn't even like realize I hadn't picked up a camera. It just sort of like the time passed. But I got really busy, um, you know, trying to figure out how to be a teacher. And for the first time in my life since I was 16, I wasn't told to photograph something from a teacher. No one was assigning me projects and I was never taught how to assign myself projects. Um, so <laughs> I'm just admitting this because I know, like I said, some of you just graduated and this might happen to you. You might find yourself in a similar situation where for the first time in your life, you're not being told to photograph something. Um, so I'm just urging you to like keep my situation in the back of your head and really try to find things that interest you that you can photograph even just for fun, just to keep yourself involved. Um, and I don't know, just, just throwing that out there. <laughs> um, but things were different back then also, like it wasn't normal to take pictures on your phone. Um, most phones didn't even have cameras on them at all. And like I said, I hated digital photography and I was a large format photographer. It was a lot of effort to go out and take pictures with a large format camera. So I'm not making excuses, it's just like the reality. Um, but hopefully you guys will not find yourself in that situation. Um, so with that being said, um, after two years working at that job, I was laid off with 900 other teachers in my district. Um, so I was forced to find a new job and I found my dream job. So I found a high school photo teaching position and I moved um, to Central Jersey to take it. So I'm still working there now. It's been 10 years. Um, I teach 35 millimeter film um, in a dark room and digital photography. So in 2010, I had to teach myself how to use a digital camera, how to use Photoshop so that I could teach it to my students. Um, and I found myself so incredibly inspired by my students, um, what they were making. I started shooting again. I was photographing digitally. I was posting my pictures on Facebook. And then by March of that next year, um, I accidentally started my own photo business <laughs> because people on Facebook were like, oh, your photo photos are so great. Like, can you photograph this bar mitzvah for my aunt? And then my college roommate's sister was having a baby shower and they wanted me to photograph that. Um, so I was photographing these events and then um, people that were at those events started contacting me to photograph things for them. Um, and before you knew it, I had my own business. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, let me see. Does that work? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I started my own business and I was totally clueless at the time. Um, <laughs> but for the next five years, I focused all of my energy on teaching and um, growing this business. So I've evolved to market myself towards um, like outdoorsy moms and adventurous families. And I specialize in helping those families create like um, out like family albums, really nice ones, gallery walls for their homes um, to showcase their photos and their memories and our photo shoots. 
Um, you can see I photograph like babies and this is an engagement session. I love when people bring their dogs, um, maternity sessions, families, like first birthdays, um, all kinds of things. I do still photograph um, parties, but no weddings, um, just like birthday parties and baby showers and things like that. Um, and then, so after five years of heavily focusing all of my photographic endeavors on my business, I started to realize in myself that I wasn't photographing for fun anymore, um, unless I was like on vacation, in which case I would bring my pinhole camera. Um, and I was really only taking my camera out when I was working. And I found in that time that creating photographs on commission, although it's like a ton of fun and I found it really rewarding. Um, and I love my business and like photographing for all these wonderful people. But to me, it's not the same as creating um, artwork for myself. So I started to get this like familiar, you guys maybe have experienced this yourself too this like aching in my body to create artwork um, and I didn't want to do it with my digital camera so I found a way to like go back and start making work the way I had in college um, like using film and working with my hands and from here is where I started like my journey getting back into making art which was really only in like 2015 or 16 so over like the last four or five years um, and all the work I'm going to show you, you can see I have like a whole folder organized here um, it's all work that I am uh, it's all ongoing and it's all different mediums and I'm working on them all simultaneously. So this is something I made for like an artist talk I did a while ago in February. Um, just like a collage of some of my work. You'll see that um, my subjects uh, are typically always involving nature, um, that my techniques and approaches are varied, um, and that the majority of my concepts um, like you mentioned before, are based around the relationship that either I myself or like humans in general have with Mother Nature. So all the work that you see here is considered um, photography, but not all of it was created with a camera. Instead, I often create art with photochemistry, um, photo papers, and light. And it's not that I'm anti-camera per se. Um, I just really love the magic that can happen outside of the realm of traditional photography. Um, and I really love working with my hands and like analog processes. So um, around that same time that I started like diving further into like being a fine artist, um, I was also really inspired by my students' reaction to pinhole photography. Um, teaching pinhole photography every semester and like seeing the magic of that process through their eyes every time I taught it like really made me fall back in love with it myself. Um, so it's my favorite type of photography. And then have, I guess you guys don't have your audio on, but I was going to ask if you, any of you guys like have ever done pinhole photography before? Or Ali, is it something that you teach in your courses? We do, and I would love if the students, you know, I forgot I asked everyone to sh put their mics off, but yeah, if anybody <laughs> wants to kind of share their experience or, um, we'd love to hear. I mean, I failed a couple times, that's about it. <laughs> you said you, you know, failed like, a couple times? Like, I, I've done it, it's just that I've um, tried to make a pinhole camera with Allie, mm -hmm. and I failed many times, and I gave it up. And then I had to redo it again with um, another professor. Okay. Did you get it to work finally? No. Oh, well, maybe um, maybe I can help you. <laughs> You'll have to message me on Instagram. Okay. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like Joe is being really humble. He's quite a genius. And like, oh. by, you know, transferring an SX-70 to a pinhole, yes. he, you know, oh, he, had a, cool. yeah, he did a four by five. Like, don't listen to him. He was... <laughs> <laughs> quite inventive I, I actually had I actually had to give back that camera oh well but you made me work with it <laughs> well um if there's anyone that hasn't used a pinhole uh, camera before it doesn't really know what that is it's the earliest form of a camera and therefore it's like the absolute simplest it's literally just like a dark box, um, any box, with a really tiny like pin poked into it. Um, and just by having a dark box with a little tiny pin hole poked into it, you've actually created a camera. So you can make your own. It seems like Joe makes some pretty cool ones. Mine are typically just made out of like 
Altoids containers, um, or you can purchase them and then you can use either film or darkroom paper inside. So these are some of my just like normal pinhole photos. And like I said earlier, I always take pinhole cameras with me on vacation. So the ones you're seeing here were taken on an Ondu camera that I purchased um, that takes medium format film. So uh, I did, took these in December. I went on a road trip by myself to North Carolina um, over Christmas break just to hike every day. And I stayed in a hostel and like took photos. Um, my favorite part of the trip was actually these horses um, in Massey Gap in Virginia. I did some like cool multiple exposures. And these ones are from a camping trip I took last October um, with my brother and his wife. Uh, out on the beach in Long Island. And then these ones I included, um, these are my earliest vacation ones that I could find from 2013 in Acadia National Park. They were taken on paper, um, darkroom paper instead of film. But the reason I put them in here, even though I don't like totally love them, is because taking these pictures and processing them and seeing them uh, really solidified for me how much I loved pinhole photography and that this would be like my ultimate vacation camera, um, as well as the beginning of me discovering how I could incorporate the aesthetic of this medium into a concept or like into my work itself. So the reason I say that I love to take it on vacations um, is because when I do go on vacation, I like go out into the middle of the woods. I like go hiking and camping. I'm like not like a resort and like hotel person. Um, and I'm kind of like airy and like a free spirit. And um, I feel like the pinhole camera itself um, kind of mimics this like feeling that I get when I'm experiencing a new place because it makes like these long exposures um, with like a lot of movement you can do like multiple exposures like here my brother's like head is moving and I just kind of like that like a uh, whimsical sort of like magical feeling within them um and really focusing in on that movement and that long exposure that I love um it allows me to be able to experience something uh, one of my like issues with photography, although please don't get me wrong, photography is like my love of life. Um, but when you're experiencing the world by looking through the viewfinder and like the lens of a camera, I feel like you have this barrier between you and what's happening in front of you. And with a pinhole camera, you just kind of like put it on a tripod and sit it next to you. And it like takes a minute long exposure while you get to stand there and experience that minute yourself as well. And I just love that. Um, like being able to be present. So with that being said, um, what I'm most known for is something called uh, my solarography, which is taking the idea of like a long exposure pinhole photo to the extreme. Um, and so I really capitalized on like the long exposure. So I have this slideshow, it's just gonna kind of like go while I talk over it um, and I'll explain to you what you're seeing. So. Here you're seeing um, conceptually the melding of my love of pinhole photography and that continuity of my concept of humans relationship with mother nature. Except in this series, instead of me making artwork about mother nature, I'm asking mother nature to make artwork with me and we're actually collaborating and making the artwork together. Um, so the concept of these art pieces uh, for me personally is actually in the collaboration. It's more like a performance art to me, um, but to you, you guys just get to see like this beautiful piece. And like, luckily I'm able to like take this performance that I've done and like hang it on a wall. Um, but for me, it's really in that performance. So um, to continue, like what you're seeing here um, with each of these, they started with me creating a pinhole camera out of like a recycled storage container. Um, so I make the camera and load it with uh, paper. And then I hike out into the woods, which hiking is my absolute favorite thing to do. So I get to hike out into the woods, I tape the camera up to a tree, and I leave it up for purposefully, like an absurdly long time to purposefully um, overexpose the paper that's inside of it. So if you've never used pinhole photography before, like a normal, quote unquote, like normal, for all the photographers in here, I think everybody's a photographer, you know that like a normal exposure would be like one second or maybe like one minute for pinhole photography. But for these, I'm leaving them out for months, sometimes multiple years at a time. So they are extremely overexposing. Um, and in that time, 
the camera is sitting there, it captures an image of everything that's not moving, including the sun. So all the streaks of light that you see, um, like that one particularly was taken for one full year. Like here, all those streaks of light in the sky, that's the sun every single day as we rotate around it. So the more sun streaks you see, the longer the exposure was. Um, and then during that exposure, it rains, it snows, temperature changes, it's really hot in the summer, really cold in the winter, and that's where like the collaboration comes in because Mother Nature um, is like destructing my cameras and the paper itself um, while it's making an its exposure. Um, and then the cool part is that I literally don't know what the picture is going to look like until I open up the camera. There are so many different like weather related variables that could happen to my image. So the camera uh, size and shape the location, the subject matter is all chosen by me, but the final outcome is completely dictated by mother nature. Um, and that's like so exciting for me is this like spontaneous, like you open it up, you don't know what you're gonna get. I just sort of like, I love that. Um, so when I look at the artwork, once again, like I do truly love them, but it's more of a like performance art to me personally as the artist. Um, it's like really adventurous. Like I that I get to go hiking in the woods. I'm, I have to go off trail because um, if I put the cameras where someone can see them, they'll get stolen. So I have to like go out into the woods. I use a compass. Um, I got to find like the right location. I have to keep track of where I'm putting the cameras by like tacking in like GPS coordinates. And then like the really fun part for me is months later trying to find the camera again. Like as a kid, my favorite thing was like Easter egg hunting. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Um, so ha like having this like scavenger hunt and then like opening up the camera and just like not knowing what's going to be inside of it and I just love that so um this process itself is really cool but like going back to me having a really like logical brain um <laughs> it's not enough for me as an artist just to make these and just to say like oh this is really cool I'm just gonna keep making them I don't know why I put so much pressure on myself like maybe I'm wrong in this but it's just how my brain works um but I need to have like the synthesis of an idea and process like I can't just do it for the sake of doing it even if I do think it's really cool so over years of ex maybe like four years of experimenting with these like really long exposures um, I found ways to kind of take this process and infuse it with, um, with concepts. So um, I'm going to share with you some of those. Uh, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so when you're opening the camera and like pulling out the paper, mm -hmm. like the, the results that we just saw, is that what you're seeing when you're pulling it out or yeah. are you... So this is such a good question. Um, and I actually have this I made for my students. This is what it looks like inside of the camera. So you actually see the picture itself um, on the film. And then I don't process it in a dark room, even though it's dark room paper, I then scan it. And mm -hmm. from my scanner, this is I well, I scan it and then I flip it horizontally because like a pinhole image is taken backwards. So I flip it and then turn it from a negative to a positive. And typically they look like this column, like kind of dark um, and like a little bit lifeless. So I don't do too much editing to any of my photos. I really, um, in Photoshop or actually now I use Lightroom instead of Photoshop, um, but I just like increase the exposure and the contrast just to give it like a little bit more oomph. So it's like such a great question. But any so any colors that are happening are are from like the weather and the like the exposure to like the elements and then of mm -hmm. course like the inverse. Yeah, definitely. Um, That's which so is, cool. Yeah, isn't it cool? And the coolest part is that I'm using black and white photo paper. Yeah. So the colors are coming from it. So I don't know if any of you have ever made a lumen print before, but like you'll know that like the lumen print gets like really blue and then when you fix it it turns like really pink so like the black and white darkroom paper does i don't know how but it has like colors in it that come out with like you said like um heat and moisture um all of that and like the amount of time that i leave it out for the crazier the colors get and then also type of paper too like a warm tone paper will make my photos come out like a like a cyan or like a really extreme blue color so sometimes i can manipulate it that way yeah um 
So I'll open up some of the projects that I'm working on. Um, Cause once again, like I open up the camera, I don't really know what I'm gonna get, but I will categorize them after the fact. So if I was to ever make like a book or have um, like a solo show at a gallery of, and like the theme would be like my collaboration with mother nature, these are the images or some of the images I would choose. Um, and the reason is because all of these have like very visible effects from mother nature herself. Um, like in this, these little speckles and these black blobs, this black area, that black area, that's all mold. Um, so that's happening because like obviously the moisture being like stuck inside of the camera. Anything that you see with like these speckles, like all these blue dots, the purple around the edge here, the blue dots here and here and here. This is um, rust that was formed inside of the camera and then uh, kind of stuck onto the paper itself. And like in this one and this one and this one, it sort of looks like really liquidy. Um, that's the emulsion on the paper itself sort of uh, being so saturated with water that it like melted and like dried and like remelted and redried. Um, so these ones I would say like Mother Nature like really collaborated with me on. Um, so that's like one series I've pulled from my solar graphs. Um, this one I pulled up just because it's my absolute favorite. I love this one. And then when you're scanning. Does the um, does the like the light on the paper from the scanner affect the print at all, or are you able to like preserve it pretty well? That's another really great question. Um, the scanner will affect it. Um, over the years, I found that like I want to up the DPI so that when I print these digitally, I can print them larger. But mm -hmm. then. If I up the DPI while I'm scanning, it takes longer to scan it and then like the light affects it more. So I found like a sweet spot. I typically do like 900 DPI, um, but then it visibly like deteriorates the exposure on the paper. So I couldn't scan it again at the same quality. You really only get one shot. Does storing it in like pitch black help with that? Any like at all, I know with like cyanotypes, it can kind of like regenerate them. Um, oh, that that's interesting. Kind of paper. I've never tried that. I don't know. So after you make a cyanotype, you keep it in pitch black for a while before you. If you, talk? if you like keep it, like if you're like presenting it or like if you have it hanging on like a wall with a lot of sunlight, it'll like fade. But then if you bring it into like the dark for a certain amount of time, it'll kind of regain its like rich blue. I see what you mean. Um, um, so, so like, I, I store mine in a basement. Like I have mine hanging on a wall in a basement so they don't. Oh, well, that's fun. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, with these, since I'm scanning them, the negative, uh, and since the negative gets ruined, I you could mm -hmm. just like throw the negative away. What you're seeing here is just the digital version from me scanning it. Like the, the actual paper negative itself, um, after you scan it, it's just like nothing. I wouldn't like show my negatives yeah. like in a show or anything. Yeah. Um, and then, so from like for years doing pictures outside, I started to think that it would be really cool to, to um, create them inside. So I'm like one of those, like, you know, they have like cat ladies. I'm like a crazy plant lady and I have plants everywhere. Um, so I started putting cameras in my pots and I just wanted to like see what would happen. I would also put them like on windowsills. And after experimenting with these for like a year, um, I started to notice, let me like zoom in a little bit. Um, there we go. Like in this image, you can see how the leaf, like this is the flower pot itself. And then this leaf is like hanging over the edge of the pot. And you can see how the leaf moved as the plant grew and as it moved towards the sunlight. Um, and in this one, like you can see the movement of that leaf. And here, this is really abstract, but this line is a leaf of a plant just like constantly falling over as it died. <laughs> um, and I just like really liked the 
I, I really like abstract art. So I love this one, even though nobody knows what that is but me. Um, but I loved seeing the movement. So then I thought, and I kind of paired up with um, this nonprofit in the town I live in. I live in Trenton, New Jersey. And there's a, a nonprofit called Isles. And they do like really amazing things for um, the community. They do like grants to get uh, like solar power on like houses in town and they have community gardens and they do like urban agriculture education. Um, so I went in January and I put cameras up like this is inside of their greenhouse. I did along their flower beds um, at another one of their community gardens. This is their uh, honeybee boxes. So this is in the winter when there's like nothing on the ground. So I just wanted to like capture the land itself. And then about two weeks ago, I went back and put a dozen or more cameras up at like each of their flower beds and along their tomato cages and like with each of their gardens. And I'll pick them up in August. So hopefully it'll like capture the, um, the growth of all of their plants in their community gardens, like as they grow throughout the summer. So it's just like a larger scale of my house plant series. So I'll see how that comes out. Um, this one I pulled up because it's my longest one. It was for 868 days, which happened because I forgot about the camera completely and just like stumbled upon it in the woods. I was like, oh my god, um, I don't have enough patience to wait two and a half years for a camera. So this was a really happy accident. Um, this one in term, oops, in terms of like concepts. Uh, sometimes I take solar graphs on specific days to like capture the sun on like a specific date. So this one was my brother's wedding day. I went out in the morning, they got married um, at this marina. So I put the camera up on the dock and it took the picture all day long and then I took it down the next morning. So this is facing west. So this is the sun setting on their wedding day, which they got married at night. So I thought sunset is better than sunrise. So I'll do like journaling with it. Um, and then here, sometimes I do this like movement series where I've taped them to the roof racks of my car. So for a year, I was um, capturing my commute to work. Every month I'd put a new camera on. So this is the, this is my commute to work. And then it looks like these like funky lines are all the different weekends within that month. And then here, this is um, on my road trip to North Carolina in December. So just keeping it on my car for like the, a certain duration of time. I've even put them like on my backpack while hiking for the day or like on my hat while walking around. So you can like capture the sun on specific days or to see the movement. And then, um, so those are really all the series. And then I just have like two more in case any of you ever wanna do one with multiple holes, they come out really cool. So you'll just have like the same image multiple times. And then this is something um, I started last fall, experimenting with what would happen if I put things inside of my cameras while they were exposing. So I started in the fall and I had the biggest plans for this year, but of course the quarantine has kind of like squashed <laughs> all of this. Um, I don't have access to like the printers I would normally have access to to be able to like continue, but I will share what you're looking at here, which is one of my secrets. <laughs> um, but this is a Walt Whitman lyric that I had printed on um, like uh, clear like acetate, like projection, like slide projection, plastic um, and I laid that inside of my camera and then have exposed over it and then from this idea I started collaborating um, or I wanted to start collaborating with multiple artists so far I've only got to do one and actually Katie is in here I think Katie are you still here Katie Lipens Yes, um, so Katie is an incredibly amazing artist she draws with tape um, these really incredible like geometric shapes and designs and she'll do like installations inside of rooms like three-dimensionally also but I have collaborated with her we're gonna pick up the camera next week on the 20th I think it'll be a full three months since we put it out but we put one of her artworks inside of my camera and we're kind of combining um, and then I have uh, I've made plans with other artists from town to like do drawings on plastic or paintings and put them inside and shine through. But the quarantine's kind of messed up that project. <laughs> um, so that's my, my pinhole and my solar graphy, but 
Um, I also do like some other things. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions about like- I have a quick uh, question. Yeah. Um, do you have titles for your work? I was thinking, do you, if you ever have a show, would, would your titles be like the amount of days it was outside or mm -hmm. the memories, you know, what would it be? So I'm the worst with titling my work. <laughs> I, I like, I struggle so much. Um, but I typically, um, I, so I've had a, a show with multiple of my solar graphs and I've titled them all the amount of days. And then I like in the tag, I put like the start and end time. So, and so they would know like what the exposure was. Cause I feel like when someone looks at my work, they might think it's really beautiful, but they don't know what they're looking at. So I thought it was important to like have that be in the title itself, the exposure. Um, but there are times where I've done like juried shows where it's just one piece and then I'll come up with like an actual title for the artwork. So like, oops. Um, like this one I call Cotton Candy Skies. This one is 161 days over Academy Street. So it kind of like says what it is like in the title. It's like some of them do have names, but others, um, like my houseplant series, I just call like houseplant series one, uh, like, or two, three, four, because I'm really not creative with names. <laughs> that was a good question though. We all are in the same boat, I guess. Are we? Okay, good. <laughs> I make my students title all of their work and then they're like, Miss P, what do I name it? Like how? And I'm like, I'm not helping you. I don't know. <laughs> I'm so bad. Um, but yeah, that's how I name them. <laughs> and then there's another good example of that. Like my Portrait of Trees series, they're just like Portrait of Trees 1, Portrait of Tree 2. Um, but this series, um, I'm also... I guess this one's like probably my most popular and this is the only one I've done with a digital camera actually. Um, for this series, I hike out into the woods with uh, my hiking pack filled with studio equipment and I wait for a tree to like talk to me. Um, and while like while I'm walking around when this like tree like speaks to me, I'll stop and I set up a studio around it and then photograph it. Um, so the like inspiration for this came maybe like three or four years ago. I was hiking on Christmas Eve, I think with my dad and we were like walk, like going on a hike through the woods. And I found this tree that I just like loved the texture of. And like, while I was touching it, I like realized in myself, like introspectively, like how often I touch trees while hiking and like, just like remembering like how often in my life I felt like so connected to them. Um, and having this like want to like photograph this tree because I love the texture of it. So, so I kept this like idea in my head for a while and eventually just like went out into the woods and I know that like the best way to photograph texture is with lighting having this nice like side lighting to really emphasize the three-dimensionality of it um, so I brought my studio equipment and like a black a huge black piece of fabric um, that I like hang up in the trees and photograph them and I just love them so I print these uh, 24 by 36 on German etching paper, um, which is a really textured paper. So the printing of it itself makes, like really helps the texture pull out of the, the print itself. Um, and then over quarantine, one of the things that was keeping me busy um, was creating these like toilet paper cyanotapes. Um, and I got the idea from me is just like being stuck in my house, completely bored on like a Saturday night. It's like scrolling through Instagram. Um, this was like the third week in March, like maybe a week into quarantine. And at that point, it was like when all the shelves were like totally void of toilet paper. And like there was all these memes online of everyone like making fun of all the people that like went out. And I just thought it was like so funny that like, I didn't have the chance to get toilet paper. I was like running low on it and like there's no toilet paper anywhere and like everyone's making such a big deal about like toilet paper and how typically this is like the least valued object in our lives. Like we wipe our butts with it, <laughs> but now it's like the most important thing ever. Um, and I, so I was like really bored on a Saturday night. I was scrolling through Instagram and I came across, um, you know, the Jealous Curator blog. I never really looked at Danielle 
Krista or Krista's um, like work herself, but she had just come out with a show called um, Shit Arlo Says. And I was like looking through her work and I just love like how cheeky she is. She's like so funny and like I've never really seen or like experienced like humorous art before. And I was thinking about how funny this like toilet paper thing was and it just like came to me out of like sheer boredom on a Saturday night. So I like coded all this cyanotape paper. Um, I coated it that night and then like the next morning I started making these and I loved them. So I kept making them for like a two week period. I made about 20. So this kept me busy for a while. Um, They're so then, pretty. What? They're so pretty. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I really love them. The way you apply your um, chemicals is really impressive too with the, the e order all the way around. That's so cool. Oh, thank you. Do you coat your own cyanotapes or do you buy them? Uh, I coat my own, but I usually just like slather a whole piece of paper, no white left. Oh, I like, I kind of like the white border. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's nice. I like it a lot too. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then, so I've done cyanotapes in the past before. Um, I kind of, I'll like make another like admittance that maybe I'll be embarrassed to like say in the future, but I don't really like traditional cyanotypes, just like um, someone just like putting a leaf on like a cyanotype and like exposing it. I think it's too like simple. I don't want to like offend anyone. I just, it's just like not my aesthetic. Um, and I've always, or I should play, um, I've always really liked abstract art. So when I started cyanotypes, maybe like four years ago, I, I started by coding my own papers and I was like just experimenting a lot and trying to find ways to make them more abstract because I didn't like the look of just like a leaf on a paper, blue and white. Um, so I started experimenting with instead of using glass, just putting them inside of bags. Um, so I was using like sheet protectors, like you would put in like a binder to put your like your like papers in. And I found that they made really interesting um, cyanotypes. So I started doing that. And then one morning I was actually on my way to a family photo shoot and I was going to eat breakfast and I looked in my fridge and I had some leftovers in there. So I like made, like started to make like an omelet out of like the leftovers that I had. And then the leftovers were of like veggies and things and they were in a Ziploc bag. And I was like, well, these are about to go bad. And I just threw the Ziploc bag with all the vegetables in the garbage <laughs> and like hit me the inspiration. I was like, oh my God, like, cause all right. I also have to admit something about myself, um, that I'm one of those people that like shames myself anytime I do something like environmentally bad. Like if I like buy a water bottle from like the gas station, I like, I like yell at myself in my head, like you are ruining the environment. You just bought a plastic bottle. So like, as I threw this Ziploc bag full of food in my, um, garbage. I was like shaming myself about like, I'm not composting. Like I'm using single use plastics. I just threw this away. This is ridiculous. So I pulled it out, didn't even eat my breakfast, put a cyanotape paper in, um, and found that my 10 by 10 cyanotapes actually fit perfectly into a Ziploc bag, put it in my backyard sealed it up and, um, went to my photo shoot and came back like hours later. I maybe left it out for like eight or nine hours. And I ended up with, um, this was my first one. So from here, um, I started making more of them. So now I have like a whole series. It's kind of like an activism about not really using Ziploc bags anymore, about composting, trying not to be so wasteful with food um, and things like that. So that's that series. And then just the only other thing I really have left is just some like of my newer projects. Um, I don't really have, besides this last one, these are just experiments. So like I was experimenting with cyanotypes like for a few years to find ways to make them more um, like abstract. That's what I'm doing here. These are experiments combining cyanotype and lumen prints together, but I don't quite have a, a concept yet. It's just me just like fooling around and trying to see like what I like and dislike and eventually I'll find a concept. Um, so I have this. And, this. and there's kind of like the, the overlapping and the shapes. Is this all happening on like one sheet of paper or are these like composites mm -hmm. that you're building? 
Yep, all on one sheet of paper. Wow, that's so impressive. Yeah, and then- Are you coating like darkroom paper with the cyanotype? Yes. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then awesome. this- Oh, thank you. Um, and then this one is completely different, um, taking digital negatives of landscapes and putting them on, making a lumen print of them, but making the lumen print in something that's wet so that the water comes through the darkroom paper itself, like some sort of concept about water and nature. I, I don't know yet, but just like experimenting with it. Um, so I have this one. And then this one actually does have a concept behind it. Um, going back to what I said earlier about myself um, having this like put constant like push and pull in my life of like rigidity versus spontaneity. Um, every time I make a decision, it's like, do I follow my heart? Do I follow my head? Like, why do I have to be so logical? Can I just have fun? Like, what is wrong with me? Um, so this like push and pull um, and also experimenting once again with cyanotype and lumen and the combination of the two uh, I made this one. I have two others. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment because you guys can see me again. <laughs> um, the other two I have were made on there. It's on fiber based paper, but I don't have a heat press at my house, so I can't like press them and scan them. But I've made these two over quarantine in the same process. So this kind of like push pull of like rigidity versus spontaneity. Um, so I'm kind of working on that. And I've been making these like itty bitty baby cyanotypes out of all like the little things in my yard. So I was just trying to keep busy. <laughs> um, you, I think that's tried, all I have. I was saying, have you tried using iron as, as a hot press? Because no. I did that. Oh, you did? <laughs> did it work? Yeah, so I just put like a piece of cotton cloth, not and don't put it directly, but mm -hmm. like, and then use it on high speed, and it's done in like thirty seconds. It's oh flat. really? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So yeah. I actually don't have an iron at my house, but I should order one online. <laughs> <laughs> Much cheaper than a hot press. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Cliff, I just noticed your background. I love that. <laughs> um, is there any way you could like fix the the pinhole prints to get them to kind of stay and not get damaged by the printer, or does like introducing chemicals to the process kind of ruin the prints too? You have the best questions. I love it. Um, so. You can, I do actually fix mine. I know I said before, like, just throw them away because you can't really do anything with them mm -hmm. um, because it is kind of true. But because I'm just like a very sentimental person and like a pack rat and I keep everything. Um, so I keep all of my negatives, <laughs> but I fix them. At, well, I scan them first. So they're scanned. And then I have a black bag that I keep them in. And, and then once the black bag fills, I'll like fix them all at the same time um, and fixing them takes so much of the color and the image away they fade so much they just become this like off white like orangey pinky shade um so i'm able to keep the negative but there's not really a lot you can do with it it's it kind of like ruins the picture um so anytime that you it's the same for a lumen print like if you took darkroom photo paper and laid objects on it and just like let it expose for a while, you would see that the paper is really vibrant and bright and like bright blues and sometimes pinks or purples. But then when you put that darkroom paper into the fixer to like keep your lumen print to fix it, all those bright vibrant colors go away and it just becomes this like dull, like purpley blue color. Um, and the same thing happens with the, the pinhole photos. I actually, I have a couple. I'd have to like get up and go get them if you wanted to see what it looks like. Will taking them out of the bag damage them at all? Or? Um, oh, so I can show you those also. But those literally, the ones that are in the bag look like this. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm not screen sharing anymore, am I? <laughs> I lost you guys. <laughs> um, screen share. So 
taking them out of the camera, they look like this. And then I scan mm -hmm. them. They just get like a little bit darker. And then I put them in the bag. So that's what they look like. And then after they fix, that's when they turn like an orangey pink color, like really faded. Have you ever like rescanned after you fix it? Is there any? I haven't. Do you want me here? If you guys pause for like 30 seconds, I'll be right back. I'm gonna go get one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I have a whole binder of them. Um, actually, this is like so serendipitous. I just opened up the binder and it brought me into one that I have on that scan. So this is what it looks like now. Mm. It's like all faded. And then yeah. if I share my screen again. This is what it was. See how like dark blue and pink, like how yeah. dark that is? And then after fixing, it became this like orangey color. So it's just sort of lost a lot of its life. I could certainly like re-scan it and like edit it a little bit more in Photoshop or Lightroom just to see what would happen, but I haven't done that. Something to experiment with though, for sure. I love experimenting. <laughs> Are you gonna do solar graphy? Um, I hadn't planned on it, but now I'm like super interested. The sun here is like, has just been super bright. And like, I'm in North Carolina actually. Okay. Um, and it's been sunny here um, like every day. And it's just like, I have paper, I have the means to build a pinhole. So do it. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, it seems really, really cool. The colors and like the, like just the textures you're getting are unreal. Yeah, you should do it. You could do it even just for one day. You don't have to leave it out for a whole year. The first one I ever made was only for probably less than 24 hours because I was just too excited. I had to take it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're hoping that maybe the club might do this as a project for the summer. Oh, that's a good idea. That's great. I could probably even mail anybody some darkroom paper. Like if you um have the ability to make a camera with the club but don't have paper and don't want to invest in a lot i have a lot of like even expired paper um which i've been using i heather do you use expired paper at all or mm -hmm. would you suggest that like is, would you think that's okay if i send them each some paper like oh yeah definitely okay so maybe we can work on that with the club i think you're such an inspiration really oh okay. thank you so much yeah thank you um, I will say, like, if you're going to make them at home, I'm just making the broad assumption that you don't all have dark rooms at your house, and I don't either. Um, so if your teacher sends you dark room paper, if you, like, just dim the lights in your house a little bit, you can pull the paper out and, like, cut it to size and tape it into your camera, like, in the light. You don't need a dark room, because remember, you're not, like, making an exposure and then going in and developing it in a dark room. Um, this paper is going to be out and exposing for, like, let's say three months of the summer, for 90 days. If you pull the paper out for all of, like, 30 seconds to allow you to, like, cut it really quick and put it in, it's not going to make that much of a difference which was surprising to me when I first started learning. Just, you know, don't like take five minutes to like cut it perfect and stick it in. But if you're pretty quick about it, you don't have, like you don't need a dark room. You can just do it right in your bedroom or wherever you are. Super exciting. Any, any questions? Okay. I'm wondering if, you, uh, who are your influences? Like, are you looking at other photographers who are doing solar graphy or sanotypes? Um, not really, to be honest. Um, when I first got into it, I was told about solar graphy um, through a friend of mine named Nicole Croy. So she introduced me to it and I just like ran with it. Um, she is like a huge inspiration to me just in terms of like her dedication. She has like probably 500 cameras up at any given moment. Um, for me, I have like maybe 50 to 60 up at any given moment or more, but she is just like, and I just love her because she like taught me the process and I just found her to be really inspiring. Um, but I, 
I don't know. I get more inspired by just like introspection, like thinking about my thoughts by just like daily occurrences, like with my toilet paper Santa tapes, just like being inspired by like someone else's like cheeky art. Like I, I don't typically like see someone else's work and get inspired where I want to copy them, but there's like little things that like I just really like. And a lot of my inspiration just comes from Instagram, honestly. So it's not even like these like famous artists. Um, like for example, these little, little cyanotypes I was making came from inspiration. I found um, someone on Instagram who I have become friends with makes or started making these really little two by two collages out of like cut out like uh, house plants and paint like paint swatches um and just from seeing how little her collages were I was like oh my god I like it's so cute there's so many like little things outside like maybe I'll make like little cyanotypes out of stuff that's in my yard um so I find most of my inspiration just from like trying to just like my daily life just like living a life that allows me to like think about the things that are happening around me journaling um connecting with people I don't I don't know if that answers your question. I don't really like have any like major like inspirations of like super famous artists. I was actually writing a paper uh, about experimental photography and I learned more about photography and there's this UK based artist, uh, El Britton. And he said that what he loves about it is that when he leaves the camera outside, he's a different person. And when he comes back to get it, he's a completely different person. So. I was thinking if that ever crossed your mind, you know, since you're making the work with the mother nature. Yeah, no, I love that idea. That's like such a fun thing to think about how you're always changing and like mother nature's always changing. And that's really cool. Um, no, I haven't thought in that way. You'll have to send me a link to that person's page. I want to follow them. <laughs> I'll do it right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you have a like a go-to spot where you're like do you like live in a rural area where you're putting up your cameras or will you go like do you like do like research and like go different places for your cameras because I know you you said you run the risk of people like maybe snatching them if they're too out mm -hmm. um that's a good question so I have um like I live in central New Jersey um, but I have a cabin in the Adirondacks and when I first started doing solar graphs in like 2016 I think is when I started all of them were made up there so that was my go-to spot for a long time and I was just experimenting and just like hoping anything would happen just like loved the process itself um but as like I said I've I have to find ways to make it more like authentic or not authentic, but like to make a project out of something. So that's when I started um, making my solar graphs more nearby my house. Um, so I do still just bring them like anytime I go hiking, I throw a couple cameras and a roll of electrical tape into my backpack. And like, so I'll hang them at like random places all the time. But for my projects, I've been doing them a lot in Trenton itself. Um, mostly inspired by, um, I have a solo show in October of this year at a gallery called JKC Gallery, it's in Trenton. Um, and the curator of the gallery uh, really wanted a lot more Trenton photos. So that's when I started putting them in the city. And then in the city, because I'm putting them on like sidewalks, they're very visible. Um, so that's definitely where I've done more research, trying to find like the perfect placement for them. Um, and I've, I've reached out to a lot of people to put them on rooftops um, and in houses and things like that. Um, and also like some prominent areas within the city, like we have like a battle monument in the middle of the city from like, you know, like different, uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to say like tourist attractions, what's the word I'm looking for? Like uh, historical maybe? Yeah, like historical places, like well-known areas in the city. I like try to photograph um, those objects. That's really cool. Congrats on your show. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. That's really awesome. Hopefully it still happens. And hopefully we can come. You're not that far. No, I know. That would be great. <laughs> that would be and awesome. I, now I was telling um, Nora that I have family in uh, Long Island that they live in Center Reach. Oh, okay. Awesome. <laughs> now when you go visit, you know, when we get back to travel, yeah. we'll, we'll have to connect. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, for sure. I put your Instagram um, oh, tag, yeah. I guess you say, um, in the chat. So um, for, for our guests, if they want to follow you. 
Awesome. I'm always online. So if you guys ever have any questions or like want to message me about anything, feel free. Definitely. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Have you tried putting the pinhole inside your house for a longer period of time since mm -hmm. it will be exposed to light? Yes, um, I have done some. I tried to do them in my cabin with not a lot of luck. I guess it's too dark in there. <laughs> um, and then in my house, it just based off of that experiment, I've put them in the windowsills of my house. Um, and then especially by my plants. So I do a lot in my windows that have my plants on them. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, um, are there any cameras out in the world right now that you might have just forgotten about? Or? Oh, for sure. <laughs> that's, that's so fun. <laughs> Yeah, so the ones that are at my cabin, um, I don't have cell phone service there and there's no Wi-Fi or anything. So I don't have the means to mark them like GPS coordinate and there's a lot of property. So I just put them up and that's how I got that 868 day long one is because I totally forgot it existed. Um, so <laughs> I've forgotten right them up there, but anytime I'm in like New Jersey or like on vacation, uh, I... I mark them with GPS so I'm able to like go back and find them again. So I might like forget about it in my head for a while. And then when I like go back through my list of things I have to like pick up in the future, I'm like, oh yeah, like I should go get that camera. That's um, crazy. That's so fun. But that reminds me also, you asked about like planning and things. I also bring them on vacation. So flying with those cameras is really interesting. Like I went to Morocco last year and brought a bunch with me and I was so nervous like going through like JFK airport and then like being in a country where the, the main language is Arabic, which I don't speak. And like if they think it's a bomb and I'm trying to get on the plane, like <laughs> what do I do? So it's, it's always interesting, <laughs> but I do. I bring them on vacation with me and I always bring them when I'm hiking just in case I like find uh, somewhere cool to hang a camera. Do you have like a style that you mainly use or are you just like using more like homemade ones? All homemade ones. Actually, I have one right here. Um, I forgot I brought this out. So it's just like an Altoids container and then I paint it black inside. This is, I put a masking tape and then I tape the paper in. So that's why that got scraped up and then, yeah. Wow. They're all homemade. That's really awesome. Yeah. When you're on the plane, are they not loaded? So this way, if they want to open them up, they can see them. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I have to show you how inspired I am. I bought like... <gasps> yes! Oh, that's so exciting. I have like to get for escape. I'm going to make pinholes. Yes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that is awesome. Did you get them on Amazon? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I collect, I, I try to use as many like recyclable ones as I can, but I don't come across so many that to get me started, I bought a whole bunch of these. So I have like over a hundred that I bought on Amazon. And then I like just to help me supplement all the ones that are recycled that's awesome oh keep in touch about it i want to see how they go yes you really inspired me <laughs> hey i love that thank you <laughs> so speaking fun. of uh building cameras there's a guy named Bear, uh brendan uh barry yes who's um who made a ca uh, caravan into a camera mm -hmm. and it also makes um a pineapple a camera yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, he's so cool. I love following his Instagram and like just seeing all the crazy things he comes up with. He actually also, um, I don't know how he got it, maybe through a grant or something, but he got a whole floor of a skyscraper in New York City and turned the whole floor into a camera. It was really cool. That sounds interesting. Yeah. You've also made like camera obscuras before. How was that experience? Yeah, I love camera obscuras. Um, I just, they're so magical. It's, it's kind of funny because like if you just looked out your window, you'd obviously get like such a better view of the world. But I just love, 
I don't know. It's kind of why I like pinhole photography too. It's just so magical. Um, so I make them at school for my students. And then I made one uh, the first weekend of quarantine. I made one in my house and put like instructions on Instagram. So I don't know. They're just so fun. <laughs> But yeah, basically like making a camera obscura is like turning your room into a camera. So if you had darkroom photo paper big enough to go like on the whole wall of your house, you could make your room a camera. Which one day I would like to do that. Like you mentioned Brendan Berry, like I would love to have a truck and like turn it into a camera obscura or like a camera. I, I just love the idea of that. We have some some comments in the chat people appreciating and loving your work and they're super inspired oh yeah thank you so much guys i'm glad that you all came thank you so much really so generous of your time to share um everything that you do and and your your secrets um and really such a huge inspiration for us all thank you so much thank you really thank you. Here we give you a round of applause if everybody Aww. wants to you know, undo their mics and, and, <laughs> and show their face and say hi or thank you. Yeah, so sweet. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So thank beautiful. You so much. Yeah. And we'll, we'll definitely keep you up to date on how the club does with their pinhole project. Yeah, I can't wait to see them. That's so great. I love it. Yeah, we're super excited. Thank you, really. So much inspiration. Okay, you're so welcome. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> we really have Manor. She made contact with you, I believe, um, through Instagram mm -hmm. and then through Michael and Caroline, through our, our club um, president and graduate advisor. We were able, and your generosity, we were able to make this happen. So we really can't thank you all enough. Yeah, thank, thank you guys. Thank you. Okay. Really great. Thank you so much. Okay. You're so welcome. Thank you. We'll be in touch. And okay, sounds good. Well, thank you so much, guys. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.